All right, so we're gonna continue on. We ended talking about the different types of impression trays that we can use. So you have your quadrant trays, you have a sectional tray, and then you also have a full tray. Um, so again, the quadrant trays are usually used for just one quadrant of the patient's mouth. So remember, if you think about like a, a chart, like quadrant one, two, three, four, et cetera. So you would use one, you would use that quadrant tray for one of those quadrants. And we said that if you're using a tray for the upper right, that same type of tray can be used for the lower left. And if you're using a tray for the upper left, that same type of tray can be used for the lower right. It's kind of in a diagonal motion. So here in this picture where we left off, the gray tray here on the side is a quadrant tray. The one here in the middle is what we call a sectional tray. So you would use this for just the anterior teeth, K9 to K9. And then on the left, I'm sorry, on the right is where you have the full tray that you can use for an entire arch. Okay, was there any questions about some of the things we spoke about in the first session before we move on? <clears throat> okay, so you guys are gonna go on mute. So if I ask a question and you wanna answer, you can just unmute yourself. So um, the trays that we use, they all come in specific sizes. I should say the stock trays, right? So they're either gonna be small, medium, large, they're either gonna be quadrant, sectional, or full tray. But sometimes there may be some situations where you have a patient where uh, the tray, you can't find a size that fits them. And in that case, you can adjust the tray in a way to make it fit that patient. So for example, if all of the trays are too small for your patient, what you can do is you can take some dental wax, because we usually have wax in our, um, in our laboratories, and you can use the wax to extend the tray. So it's kind of like you're creating a new border around the tray. Or if you have a tray that cannot be seated all the way down into the patient's mouth, maybe their teeth are too long, you can also use the wax to extend it in that way. And I'll try, I'll write myself a note, I'll try to find a video of what that looks like. Um, because again, when these stock trays are made, they're made approximately of what a small mouth looks like, approximately what a medium mouth is, approximately what a large mouth is. But you may run into situations where none of them will fit a patient. And, and we don't want to just tell the patient, well, none of our trays fit you, so there's nothing we can do. We have to kind of figure out a way for us to accommodate them. And by using a wax to change the shape or adjust the shape, of the tray, it allows us to be able to, um, you know, take impressions of all patients, regardless of what their mouth looks like. There also are some situations where a patient has like a very deep palate, and uh, that can stop us from being able to seat the impression tray as well. So again, we can use wax to extend it uh, in order to, uh, you know, make sure that the tray fits and we can get a proper impression of that patient. Custom trays. So custom trays are just like the name says, it's a tray that is custom made to that patient's mouth. But in order for you to create a custom tray, you have to first take that preliminary impression. So you have to take an impression with the alginate. Then you have to create a study model for the patient. So a model made out of stone. And then you will use that model to create a tray that would fit the patient a little bit better. The custom tray material is not the same as the material that the stock trays are made of. Um, it's made out of acrylic, so like almost like the acrylic that we use for our nails, um, but it's a lot thicker. Uh, and it also has a little bit of resin material in it as well. And at, if you're the one creating it, you have to kind of shape it around the model. You have to create the handle for it yourself. Um, but most offices will, you know, send the impression, the preliminary impression to the lab and ask the lab to make it. It just kind of depends on whether or not you have the um, equipment in your office to create the custom trays. If you don't, it's fine. You can just send your model to the lab and they'll create a custom tray for your patient. Are there any questions so far? Now, usually custom trays, I would say they're used for um, 
Like if you're creating a denture because denture or a partial denture, whether it's a full or a partial, because dentures have to be um, like they have to be designed perfectly to that patient's mouth because you have to remember it's replacing teeth that they don't have. And then also because they have to keep pulling it in and out of their mouth and you want it to be comfortable. So we take a preliminary impression for a denture and then we create a custom tray because we have to measure how their lips move. So we wanna make sure if they're speaking with the denture in their mouth, that it's gonna be comfortable. The denture is not gonna be scraping against their lips. We have to look at how their jaw moves. So we, the custom tray makes it so that when we're taking these different shots of the patient, uh, we're getting an accurate depiction of how that denture is gonna sit in their mouth to make sure they're not uncomfortable or it's not cutting into their mouth. Um, or anything like that. Okay, any questions about custom trays? Okay, so tray adhesive. So we briefly spoke about tray adhesive this morning and only in the aspect of some trays are made to where you don't need to use adhesive and some you have to. So for example, we said that the trays that have perforations in them, meaning they have holes in them, uh, you don't really need to use adhesive because the holes are what going to lock the material in place. But then we have some um, we have some trays that are without perforations or that have very few, and it's very useful for you to use uh, different types of tray adhesives in order for the material to stick. Because the point is that we don't want to put the impression into the patient's mouth, and for when we remove it, once it sets, we don't want it to fall off the tray. So if there's a possibility that it can fall off the tray because of, you know, the design of the tray, then it's very helpful to use an adhesive. So here they have listed the different types that we can use. And the adhesives here are based on what type of material you're going to use. So when we go through after this, we're going to talk about different materials probably on, um, on a Wednesday because we're just going to end with alginate today. And you'll be able to match which adhesive you use for which material. So if you're using a polyvinyl siloxane or a polyether impression material, then you can use a VPS adhesive, which is blue. And again, when we go into those other impressions, we will go into what are these different polyvinyl uh, impression materials, rubber base and silicone. Okay, so if you are using a rubber base impression material, you're going to use a rubber base adhesive, <clears throat> which is brown, okay? And if you get confused, I would say that's why the colors are here, because the colors are much easier to remember, to match a color to an impression material than trying to remember of like the scientific or the technical name of it. If you think about this color goes with this impression, brown goes with rubber, orange pink goes with silicone. So if your impression material is mainly made of silicone, then you're going to use the orange pink. And even when we go through the different types of materials, it's, it's very unlikely for you to always remember every single one of them. But if you try to remember uh, the ingredients or make yourself little flashcards like blue, and then on the other side, you say polyvinyl, things like that. And then when you are using a material, you look at the box and see what is the ingredients in it, what material is being used. So if you see silicone, then you want to go look for an adhesive that's made for silicone. If you see rubber, then you want to use an adhesive that's made for rubber. Does that, anybody confused by that? So even if you don't know technically what the impression material is, uh, which adhesive is supposed to be used for it, if you kind of remember what matches together, all you have to do is look at the box, look at the, the container that it comes in and see what's the main ingredient. And that will help you match it with one of the three adhesives. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, because we're going to talk about a lot of generic types of adhesives, but you, there's a lot of different brands out there, and you may see one in the clinic for with our, in our classes, but you may go to your office and they have a totally different brand, and that's not important. What's important is what is the ingredients, what material is being used to um, create that uh, impression material. All right, so we're going to talk about hydrocolloid materials. So if you break this word down, hydro means water and colloid is gelatin, okay? So <clears throat> when we use alginate, 
and, and our, some of our final impressions as well, they're considered hydrocolloid materials because we have to use water in order to activate it. Uh, when you are mixing your alginate impressions, as some of you know, some of you who were able to practice it before, you have to mix water into the powder and that's when you finally get that jelly-like consistency, okay? Now, when you have hydrocolloid types of materials, it can be reversible or it can be irreversible, okay? Irreversible materials, that's alginate because once alginate sets, you cannot go back and, and make it into a jelly again, right? Once that solution becomes a solid, you cannot add water to it or add um, more any type of liquid to it or add it or heat it up or anything like that in order to change it back to a solution. Once it's a solid, it stays a solid and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so that's why we always talk about making sure that you can uh, you can mix it fast enough that it doesn't set before you place it into the patient's mouth. Because if the material sets before it gets to the patient's mouth, there's nothing you can do. Now you have to do a whole mix all over again. Anybody confused about irreversible uh, solutions or irreversible materials? Okay, so next we have reversible solutions. And these are materials or impression, impression materials that even if it sets, you can heat it up or add hot water or add cold water to it. And the change in temperature will make it revert back to its original state. So if it started off as a solution and it started to get too hard, you can add water to it in different temperatures and it'll be able to go back from being a solid uh, into a liquid. When we create our models, you'll see that uh, the dental stone material, we have some material that if it's starting to get hard while you're mixing it, you can add some water to it and it'll give you a little bit more working time. It'll make it, um, it'll, it'll decrease how solid the material is so you have more time to work with it. But even then, you don't get like, it doesn't go all the way back to the start you just probably get like a minute or two more to work with it. You still have to move quickly uh, in order to create uh, whatever model you're making or, or um, whatever application you're doing for that patient. Okay, so I kind of pretty much went over this slide already. Irreversible hydrocolloid is alginate. <clears throat> alginate is irreversible, meaning once that alginate sets, that's it. If it sets before you put it in the patient mouth, you might as well throw everything in the bowl away and start all over. You cannot, you cannot use it if it sets already. Like you cannot bring it back to being a solution when it already becomes a gel. Once it becomes a gel, once it hardens, that's it. You gotta, um, you have to start over. Okay, so here's what alginate is made of. It's made of potassium alginate, which comes from seaweed. Um, it's sometimes, they say potassium alginate can come in some ice creams to make it thicker. Uh, it also has calcium sulfate, which is what helps that reaction happen. It's what helps it uh, go from being a, a liquid solution and transforming itself into a gel. Trisodium phosphate is added to slow the reaction time so that it doesn't set as quickly. So what I would recommend to help remember this I, like I always recommend, because I think it's one of the best ways to study, is to make yourself flashcards. Put the ingredient on one side and put what is its purpose on the other, and then just practice it in that way, okay? So <clears throat> you know what the ingredients are and what exactly it's doing for uh, that uh, solution. Okay. <clears throat> Some more ingredients are diatomaceous earth, which is just a filler. It's, it's just something that makes it bulky so it's not, um, so it can uh, last longer. So you, you kind of have more material to work with. Then we have zinc oxide, which is also just a, it's like a filler. It's just to make it so you have more material. It doesn't really help with the <clears throat> with the chemistry of it. It doesn't really help with the reaction that happens. It's just so you have more material to work with. And then potassium titanium fluoride, that ingredient in itself is not as important for the alginate to set, 
but we, we need it so that when the alginate mix with the dental stone that we're gonna use later on, it doesn't change the shape or it doesn't change the composition of the alginate. So for example, if we did not have potassium titanium fluoride in the alginate, when we move to the next step of creating the model, what would happen is the alginate would not like withstand the chemical reaction of the model. So maybe the alginate could like um, distort or it would melt away or, um, or it could like uh, swell up, become like it'll change the shape of it. So the potassium titanium fluoride is there so that no matter what comes in contact with the alginate after it sets, nothing is gonna change. Um, the shape of it is not gonna change. The composition, like the chemistry of it won't change. It'll stay the same no matter what you add onto the alginate after it sets, okay? Is there any questions about these, the chemistry or composition? Okay, so physical phases, <clears throat> so this is just talking about what are the steps that alginate goes through when you're mixing it, okay? So hydrocolloid impressions, they have two stages. First is the solution stage, and then we have the gel stage. So the solution stage is when you have the powder and you've mixed the water in it, and at first it's just a liquid solution and you'll notice that as you mix it it becomes less like a liquid and it's starting to become more solid okay so the next step is the gel phase or the solid phase and this is where it's semi-solid and it looks kind of like dessert like a, a pudding or jello or yeah like gelatin um once it becomes a solid there it there's nothing you can do to it anymore like you can't change the shape of it whatever shape the alginate is in when it goes into the solid phase is the shape it's going to stay. So the point is that you want to make sure that it goes from solution to solid in the patient's mouth. You want, you don't want it to go from solution to solid before you put it in the patient's mouth because then you're not going to have an impression. You're just going to have hard material that you can't do anything with. Okay. Um, the strength of the hydrocolloid is not as great and that's why we don't use alginate for uh, like um, those indirect restorations. We use what we call elastometric impression materials, which we're going to talk about on Wednesday. So the, again, alginate is not strong enough for us to use for to create a crown or to create a bridge or, or to send off to create a, um, a veneer. Okay. One of the reasons is when alginate stays out for too long, so let's say you've mixed it, it became a solid, you took the impression, right? So now you have a solid impression of the patient's mouth. If I was to take that impression and leave it on the countertop, by the time the next day comes around, that impression is going to shrink. Because what happens is being exposed to the air, all of the water that is in the material kind of evaporates in a sense. And because that happens, it, the material itself shrinks. And if the material shrinks, then that means your impression is not accurate. Your impression is not an accurate depiction of what that patient's mouth, look, mouth looks like. And so that's what makes it different from the elastometric because the elastometric is not going to shrink. So again, we're not gonna use alginate for uh, creating our permanent crowns, permanent bridges, permanent veneers. We have to use the final impression material. Okay, anybody have any questions? All right. <clears throat> so uh, alginate itself is not, um, although it's not strong enough to withstand in the long term, it's strong enough to withstand in while you're working with it. And what you'll find is you'll see a lot of uh, studies that say like when you create an alginate or when you take an alginate impression, you should plan to create a model from that impression within the first 30 minutes or within the first hour of taking that impression, because that's when your material is going to have its highest strength level. Okay. Um, 
you also need to be very careful about paying attention when you're taking the impressions. I've seen a lot of people take impressions and then walk away from the patient while the impression material is in the patient's mouth. Now, what that can do is that can, first and foremost, if you let it get too hard in the patient's mouth, it can lock onto the patient's teeth. And then when you try to take it out, it can tear. Another thing is if you leave it in the patient's mouth without monitoring it, you, the patient could move their teeth around or move their jaw or, or you know, uh, disrupt how you placed the tray in their mouth. And then now you don't have an accurate impression. <clears throat> so you have to be very careful um, about timing. Timing is very important. Uh, alginate does not take long to complete, like to mix it place it in the tray, place it in the patient's mouth, remove it. That does not take a lot of time. So you have, but you have to be focused during that time, right? You want to make sure you're focused on how you're mixing it, making sure you have the right number, the right measurement of powder to the right measurement of water. You want to make sure you're timing how long you're mixing it. You want to make sure you're timing how long it's in the patient's mouth so that when you remove it, it's at its maximum strength for you to go ahead and create that, um, that model for the patient. So alginate itself, is, it's, it's usually you can order it and it comes in like a, a, a bin, like a little jar. Um, sometimes it comes in these little packs, like a vacuum sealed packs. It just kind of depends on what manufacturer you use. Uh, they usually come with uh, a little scoop, and it also comes with a little container for you to measure your water. You want to use the scoop and the water measuring cup that comes with your alginate because that'll make your mix the most accurate. So for example, you may see it says for a small tray, you use one scoop of powder to one uh, line measurement of water. But if you use a scoop and a measuring cup that comes from a different alginate bin, you may not have an accurate measurement. So you wanna to try to stick to what came in your package. Sometimes the material comes in different flavors, um, but I would say those are usually not good ones to use uh, because even though it may say like the flavor is cherry, they usually taste really disgusting. I'd rather just use one that has no taste, um, even though that, is kind of weird in your mouth, in the, in the patient's mouth, I would say, but it's only for a few minutes. Um, we also have some alginate that changes color and the change in color is what tells you when it's moving from a solution to a solid. Uh, the ones we have in our clinic, they change color. It starts off as like, a, um, it starts off as blue, the powder is blue. When you add water to it, it becomes like this nice pink magenta color. And then when it's setting, when it's becoming a gel, it turns into a bluish color again. And then when it's completely set, it's going to be white. So you can pay attention to those colors and it'll let you know approximately how much time you got to work with it. So for example, if it's starting to go from magenta to blue, then you know you need to, you, you kind of have to pick up the pace and, and mix a little bit faster. And then shelf life, alginate can approximately be held for one year. Um, but all of our materials have expiration dates. And legally, in, an, in a dental office, you cannot have uh, materials that are expired. Even if it's still working properly, you cannot have expired materials in your office. Now, when you get back to our clinic, we have expired stuff in there. And that's just because we get a lot of donations. But if you're in a real dental office, you wanna make sure that you're checking expiration dates because if OSHA comes in to inspect your office and you guys have expired materials, that's something that the office can get fined for. So you always wanna make sure you check. And alginate is something that people forget to look at the expiration date for because they just assume it's always going to be good. Just make sure you're, you're checking the date before you use it on a patient. Okay, here's an example of what alginate can look like. Comes in a little pack with the alginate material in there. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a little water measuring cup here as well. Um, and then it usually has some scoop, a scoop for you to um, remove the powder. Uh, most alginate materials must be poured within the hour of taking the impression to avoid dimensional change. So that's the, the change I'm saying, the water in it can start to release from the material and that causes your impression to shrink, okay? Two things we need to talk about, Im imbibition. 
So imbibition, not to be confused with inhibition, right? Imbibition is when the alginate is, is uh, stored in like a paper towel, what will happen is it will absorb that water in order to keep it, um, in order to keep its shape. But this has to be, this has to be done um, strategically because if you put too much water, the alginate is going to soak up all that water, but then it's also going to expand. So if you cannot pour, like create your model right away, I would take a paper towel and wet it with water, but not soaking wet. Just kind of make it a little moist and wrap the alginate with it so at least you know it won't shrink. But you don't want to take your alginate impression and drop it in a, a bin of water or soak it with, um, or put a whole bunch of soaking paper towels onto it. Okay, you want it to absorb the water, but you don't want it to be too much water. Um, and then we have scenarios. Uh, if the al alginate impression remains in open air, meaning, meaning you take the impression, you don't even put a wet paper towel on it, you just leave it in the air. What happens is it will, the water will evaporate, like I said, and that impression will shrink. It will distort. And then whatever you create from that impression will not be accurate to your patient. Okay, so imbibition is when the water is soaked in to the impression, which can cause it to expand or get bigger. And scenarios is when the water is released or evaporates from the material and that causes it to shrink. Okay, any questions about these two? So types of settings, um, again, this is something important to look at when you're using impressions, especially if you're going to a new office, to look at whether or not you have a normal set of alginate or you have a fast set. I believe the one we have in the office is a fast set alginate. So normal set means you have two minutes of working time. What do you think is working time versus setting time? What would working time be in this scenario? Uh -huh. I'm listening. Um, how long it lasts? Mm, not really how long it lasts. So if I'm, I'm telling you with this normal set alginate, you have two minutes of working time. What do you think? What are you doing? Like two time? minutes to do it. Like to put it on and mix it together and put it on. All right. Close. Yeah. Two minutes to mix. So that means once you add the water, to the powder, you have two minutes to mix it before it starts to set. So two minutes before it goes from the solution stage to the gel stage. So that means within two minutes, you gotta mix it, put it in the tray and put it in the patient's mouth, mm -hmm. right? And then once it's in the patient's mouth, you have about four and a half minutes where it's, uh, for it to set. It takes about four and a half minutes for it to set into the patient's mouth. So, and then you can see in fast set alginate, you have one and a quarter minutes. So that means one minute and 15 seconds to mix, put it in the tray, put it in the patient's mouth, okay? And then it takes about one to two minutes to set. So that's not a lot of time, right? So if you have fast set, you gotta already in your mind, you know, okay, I need to make sure I'm mixing to, you know, so that it doesn't set before I put it in the patient's mouth. Okay, so working time is the time allotted for mixing the alginate, loading the tray, and positioning the tray in the patient's mouth. Setting time is the time required for the chemical action to be completed. So this is how long it's gonna take. Working time is how long you have to mix it, put it in the tray, put it in the patient's mouth. Setting is how long it takes for it to be completely set for that chemical action to be completed. Any questions about the difference between working time and setting time. Okay, so altering the setting time. So technically you can give yourself a little bit more time if you add colder water or cooler water to your uh, mix. Now, the issue with adding colder water is if your patient has sensitive teeth, the, tr the material is going to be colder, so then that means it's going to bother your patient. So it, in a sense, you really don't want to do that to, if it's going to be something that's going to cause your patient discomfort. 
And then of course, if you add warmer water, it shortens your setting time. So if you need it to move faster, the warmer the water, the, the faster it's going to set. Okay, the cooler the water, the longer it's going to take to set. Okay, so again, water to powder ratio, usually you are going to use the same uh, measurement of powder as you are going to of water. So here it tells you if you have an adult mandibular impression, so mandibular at the bottom, you would use two scoops of powder and two measures of water. If you're doing an adult maxillary, because max, your maxilla tends to be bigger, especially because you have your palate, then you would use three scoops of powder and three measures of water. Um, me personally, this is like a general guideline. Personally, I put three scoops of powder and three scoops of water, regardless if I'm using mandibular or maxillary. And I do that because I rather have enough of a mix than to not have enough. And if you're using a medium mandibular impression or a large mandibular impression, sometimes two scoops is not enough. And if you figure out it's not enough after you've already mixed it, it's already too late. So this is the guidelines that are followed technically. Um, I don't really follow the guidelines. I do three scoops regardless of what I'm doing. The only time I would use two scoops is if I'm using a small impression tray. But if I'm using medium and large, I'm doing three scoops. Okay, so here what the scoops look like. Here's the water measure. So when we say two scoops, right, you're not gonna take two scoops. You would just do, take a scoop and then fill it up again into a second scoop. But if you look at the water measuring cup, you see it has lines on it that says one scoop of powder. You put it up here if it's two scoop of powder and you put it up to this top line if you have three scoops of powder, right? So you have to make sure you are accurately looking at how many scoops versus how much water and they have to match up because um, if they don't, then your, your mix is not going to be right. You don't want to have too much water, and you also don't want to have too little water, because that's going to mess up, um, it's going to mess up the reaction of your alginate impression. Okay, um, so for mixing techniques for this, I'm going to show, like I said, I'm going to put up videos, because talking about mixing techniques is not helpful. This is something you have to see, and eventually you'll get to practice it. Okay, so I'll um, pull up some videos of mixing alginate and loading it into the tray and all of that. Um, and then you guys just take the time to go ahead and look <clears throat> at those videos. And then, so we're gonna skip through that because again, uh, it's better for you to see it. So when you are taking an impression, you have to explain what's going to happen to your patient. Because imagine someone just coming up to you and sticking a tray of goo in your mouth and you have no idea what's going on. So you have to tell the patient, the material may feel a little bit cool. Uh, it doesn't taste really well. It's gonna set quickly. So one thing that I always tell patients, like it says here, is to breathe in and out through their nose only. If you have an impression material in the patient's mouth and they try to breathe through their mouth, they're gonna gag and they might even throw up on you, okay? You have to make sure you remind your patients to breathe only through their nose. <clears throat> if the patient has something that they, is bothering them in the middle of the impression, have them signal with their hands or something instead of like grabbing your hands to take the impression out their mouth or anything like that. Uh, one thing I would, another technique that I've learned works really well if a patient is gagging a lot, I have them raise their le one of their legs in the air. And I know that sounds weird, but the patient is gonna focus on raising their leg and they're not gonna focus on having the material in their mouth. So that's something else you can do. If you feel like your patient is in distress, just tell them to lift their leg up because now they're gonna focus on that instead of gagging. Um, I'm gonna stop here because it's about to cut me off and I don't want it to cut me off mid-sentence. So we're gonna, like I said, I'm gonna post those videos. I didn't post an assignment today. I want you guys to focus on making sure any, all those workbooks and key terms, you submit them and anything else that you're missing, please submit them. Um, you guys should be getting emails from me today too on an individual level. Um, so go ahead, uh, make sure you go over this and we're gonna continue this chapter 46 on Wednesday. Are there any questions?
Me. You said you was po- Hey, one more time. Uh, there's no assignment for today. Make sure you put post all your workbooks and key terms. Okay. What do you want to say, Takaya? Um, the Zoom from earlier. Yes. So um, I I recorded it, but I can't load it to Google Classroom. So I'm gonna try to post it on YouTube and then connect it to the classroom. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. So Thank we you. just take a picture. Yeah. Just Hold upload up. it right to the to the um post. For whichever chapters you're post, you're sending in. Okay. All right. Thank you.